1974, some farmers in China were digging a well. But instead of finding water under the ground, they found a huge burial monument or a mausoleum that was built by an emperor, the first emperor of China in the 200s BC named Emperor Qin. And as excavationists and archaeologists came in to continue to excavate the site, what they found was that this burial monument was absolutely huge. And that not only along with Emperor Qin's body buried in the mausoleum, there was also an entire army of life-sized soldiers made out of a type of ceramic called terracotta. Some of you maybe have heard of this terracotta army. To date, excavationists have found over 7,000, almost each one about six feet tall, statues of soldiers, each one a little bit different and unique, different ha hairstyles, different facial expressions, different elements on their uniforms, all lined up in rank and in order. And along with that, they found life-size statues of horses and of chariots and real bronze weapons that they were holding in the hands of these statues. It's, um, if you've never heard about the terracotta army, look it up. It, it is crazy how big this is and how much work must have went into it. Which brings up a question that I have as I think of this. It's this question, why? Why go to all that work and all that expense and all that trouble to build an army with horses, chariots, weapons, and statue soldiers and bury it with you in a mausoleum? Part of the answer to that is connected to how Emperor Qin viewed the afterlife. But why an army? He could have buried anything with him. Why that? Well, I would conjecture that the terracotta army reflects what Emperor Qin valued most in his life. And if I could summarize what we see in Emperor Qin so many years later of what he valued, I'd summarize it this way. Power, fame, showing how, but with this huge statue, you know, army, just how great he was, and wealth. What Emperor Qin buried with him was reflective of his values while he lived. I have a question for you to consider today. What is it? that you value. Um, we live our lives according to what we believe is important and valuable. What would it be for you? Family? Uh, success? Pleasure? I'm thinking since we're gathered in church or listening to a worship service online that at least some of you are thinking God. It's always a good answer in Sunday school and in church. <laughs> Question, what do you value? Now, 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 here's the thing. I'm going to push back a little bit or at least get you to think a little bit deeper that oftentimes what we say with our words in regards to what we value is not always actually what is seen with our lives. So what is it for you? Not only what do you feel is your what do you feel that's valuable, but also what makes you feel valuable? I, I want you to think about that answer, and we're going to put it aside for just a moment. I'm going to come back to it. But as I mentioned before, we are at the end of a series where we're taking a look at this. We're taking a look at the topic of the kingdom of God. 
And the reason why we felt like this was an important thing to have a series about is because this topic of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is the topic that Jesus taught about most as recorded in the gospels, the the history or the biographies of his life. And why Jesus felt it was important is this, that you will be able to better understand God when you better understand his kingdom. You'll be able to better understand life and how it works when you better understand God's kingdom. So what is the kingdom of God as review? It's not a geographical location. The kingdom of God is not the restoration of Israel in the Middle East. When Jesus references the kingdom of God, he's talking about a rule. The kingdom of God is God's rule, his kingship, first of all, in our hearts and our lives. It's a recognition that my life is not my own, that I am not the one in charge of my life, that I am living under the rule, not of a a president or a government ultimately, but under the kingship of Jesus Christ. And it starts right here in our hearts, and we live a little bit of a glimpse of God's kingdom here on earth as he lives in our hearts, and ultimately it will be carried out forever for those who believe in Christ will live in his kingdom forever in heaven. Today, As we close, we just want to zero in on the topic of, well, what should God's people or what should people in God's kingdom value? As citizens of his kingdom, what should we value? What should be important to us? For Emperor Qin in his life, it was power, fame, and wealth. I'm not sure how you answered that question when I asked it earlier, but here's what I do know. It's our first fill-in for today. If you're part of God's kingdom, and if Jesus is the king, we should live according to his values. If Jesus is in charge, then he's the one who tells us how his people, what your lives should look like, or what should be important to you, or what type of attitude we should have. Not because he's a mean dictator, because he, but because he is the most loving, gracious, wonderful king you could ever have, and he wants what's very best for you and me. So what should that look like in our lives as we live in his kingdom? That's what we're going to unpack today. Do that, I want to go back to the end of Jesus' life. It's about two, three weeks before Jesus would die. And uh, just to give you a little bit of the the context here, uh, I have a map for you. So this is a map of Israel, and there's a lot of little town names on here. It doesn't matter if you can't exactly see the names, but I'm going to point here. The northern part of Israel, there's a town here called Caesarea Philippi. Down here, next to um, the Jordan River, or pretty close to it, is Jerusalem. And in the last few weeks of Jesus' life, Jesus and the disciples started out up here, and then we can read through the Gospels how they traveled down, ultimately ending up in Jerusalem where he would die. In Caesarea Philippi, a few weeks before his death, Um, This is, for some of you, you might recognize it. This was the event where what happened there is when Jesus asked the disciples, um, who do people say that I am? And then if you recall, Peter, the one who tended to talk first and think later, he actually had a good, quick reply to Jesus' question in this moment. And he gave this beautiful confession. Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of the Most High. And Jesus had to have been, you know, smiling either on his face or in his heart right answer. And if you recall, we looked at a couple weeks ago, is that when you hear the word Messiah, when when Peter said the word Messiah, the, the word that probably best is synonymous with that is, you're the king. You're the king sent by God. Peter confesses and professes that Jesus is the king. You know what happens right after that? Jesus Mark chapter 8, if you want to follow along in in your Bibles, you can, or otherwise, verses typically are on the screen. Right after that, Jesus began to teach them that the king, the son of man, must suffer 
must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and after three days rise again. And you can just imagine this high point moment where G- Peter professes Jesus, you're the king. Right after that, Jesus gets real with the disciples and lets them know that in the next couple weeks, I'm going to die. And the disciples didn't want to hear it. Why? Why are you going to die? It's too early to die. There's too much work you have left to do. And you see that the disciples, we're going to come back to this, still have a misunderstanding of what the kingdom of God is all about and the type of king Jesus is. So Peter, again, remember, he's the guy that likes to talk a lot. Well, he kind of speaks up for the disciples in verse 32. He spoke plainly, Jesus did, about what was going to happen. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Jesus, if, if you keep talking this way, you're going to scare people off. I mean, you're scaring us. We don't want you to die. And, and it is just so bold of Peter that he actually rebukes the king. Or in a different way to think of it, he re- the, the disciple or the student rebukes the rabbi. So what does Jesus do? But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Have you ever had someone you love call you something that really hurt? Typically for humans, for us, we do that out of anger and we say words that honestly come out of sin. For Jesus, he was just being real with Peter in regards to what he was doing in this moment. He was trying to keep Jesus from doing the work that he had come to do. And in that way, he was being just like Satan, trying to stop Jesus from his kingdom work. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. The kingdom of this world would be most synonymous with human concerns. The kingdom of God is most synonymous, of course, with the concerns of God. And the reality is, is that in this moment, Peter and the disciples show that they're still confused about all of this. And Jesus is being really clear with them. And then he tells them something else that probably would surprise them. It has to do with what it looks like to follow Jesus and be a citizen in his kingdom. Verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to follow me, whoever wants to be in my kingdom, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, we don't feel the full weight of this verse. Because we have a phrase in the English language that actually comes from Jesus. Did you know that? And it's called a cross to bear. But we use that term cross to bear for things that could be big or very small. For instance, yesterday, and mind you, it's April, we had snow in Minnesota. Did any of you know that? (laughs) My snowblower is either tired from the year or the snow was too heavy. It didn't like it. And that snowblower not working was, for me, a cross to bear. You might have a toe that's hurting. We might call something that small, but it still hurts, a cross to bear. I can't walk. It's a cross that I need to bear today. When the disciples heard the word cross, they didn't think about a snowblower or a hurt toe. They thought about an instrument used by executioners, the Romans, to torture criminals and kill them. And Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you may need to pick up a cross to follow me. I think it's good to remember this, that sometimes it's difficult living as a citizen of God's kingdom. 
And for those of you who might be, be newer to the faith and for all of us uh, who uh, you know, tend to sometimes have a skewed perspective, we need to hear this and we've talked about it before, but I think sometimes when we recognize that Jesus is our king and he has all power, we just expect that life is gonna go our way. We're gonna win the game. We're gonna make the team. We're going to have a happy life. She's not gonna get sick. He's not gonna struggle with mental health because Jesus is my king. We're not gonna go through difficult times to follow Jesus. Like it should be easy. Jesus said the opposite. That being a part of his kingdom at times means that it's gonna be more difficult, that it's the narrow road. And when you think of the 12 disciples whom Jesus is talking to in that verse, guess what? At least one or two of them, literally, like their Savior, had to carry a cross and died on it. It's not always easy being a citizen of God's kingdom. And Jesus is prepping the disciples for this. And the difficulty that they would someday face as they took the gospel message and shared it with other people. So let's go back to the map. This is happening in Caesarea Philippi. Then Jesus and the disciples head east a little bit to a place called Mount Tabor. And there, a very well-known event, Jesus is transfigured on top of that mountain in front of Peter, James, and John. It's a fancy language for saying that he showed them a glimpse of his glory and he gleamed the gospels say, like lightning. His, his holiness was being able to be seen there for Peter, James, and John. Well, then from there, they head south right here to the north part of the Sea of Galilee to a town called Capernaum. Capernaum was kind of a hub for Jesus' ministry during those three years of his ministry. He went there often. It's kind of like his home base. It also happened to be the place where Peter was from. Well, they get to Capernaum, And we are clued in on something that happened along the way. We're now in Mark chapter 9, one chapter ahead, verse 33. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, Jesus asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? Now, the first thing I want to point out is that this kind of helped, made me feel good. Reason being is that typically on road trips, there is some sort of argument in my family at some point or another. Typically, it happens towards the beginning in the whole packing and Tetris thing with all the suitcases and such. <clears throat> but even, even Jesus' disciples argued along the road. Okay, that was, that was the first thing. The other thing is that Jesus asks a question, not because he doesn't know what they were arguing about, but because he wanted to use it as a teaching opportunity. Verse 34, he continues, But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. And that seems really weird, doesn't it? That they're arguing about, uh, I'm better than you are. I'm going to have a better position than you are. I kind of wonder if some of this came about because remember, this followed Jesus' transfiguration and not all 12 went on the top of the mountain. It was only three and whether it was Peter, James, and John kind of rubbing it in the, disciple, the other disciples' noses, or maybe the other disciples kind of getting you know, a little bit jealous of that special time they had with Jesus, this is all conjecture, but it is ironic that this happened right after that. At the very least, here's what we know. Um, they were in a rabbi-student relationship here. And whether you're at work with a boss or whether you're at school with a teacher or on a team with a coach, we all tend to jockey for favor from whoever is in charge. And we see this happening again and again with the disciples. Jesus is about to die. And guess what they're focused on? They're focused on themselves. And who's the greatest? And who's the best? And who's going to have the the best position in in the kingdom that they're confused about? In fact, this happens over and over again. Um, The night Jesus started communion, the Passover meal, the night before he died, Jesus just gets done finishing 
uh, communion with them. And Luke records what happened next in Luke 22. A dispute also arose among them. This is the upper room right after communion as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Here's what I know and we've talked about in the past. When we read about these events in the Bible, they always seem at times so simple. And it's easy to think, man, those disciples, they were a screwed up bunch. And they were. But no more screwed up than you or me. You see, these pursuits of success or higher position, these are the common natural pursuits of finding value in the kingdom of the world leads to our second fill-in. So when it comes to value in the kingdom of the world, people find value in personal success and accomplishments. And if you say that you've never felt that before, You are either towards the end of your life and you're wiser than you used to be, because that does happen typically, that we get better perspective, or you're lying. Because while we are, through faith, part of the kingdom of God, we still live in the kingdom of the world. And so often, the way we feel about ourselves is affected by our perceived success or perceived accomplishments. So a question that I want to ask you is this. What scoreboard are you using right now to determine your value? Because you're using something to determine how you feel about yourself. For a younger generation, I know it's the number of views and likes that you have. And let's not kid ourselves, that's true for some in the older generation too. Maybe it's your GPA. Maybe it's the quarterly numbers that you need to make at work. And if you make them, somehow you feel (laughs) more valuable and better, of course, than when you don't. And I get that. But do they really determine your value? Maybe it's the size of your bank account, the size of the bonus, the size of your house. Maybe it's the number of friends you have or the number of vacations you're able to go on. Maybe it's what you see in the mirror that really affects how you feel about yourself. What's the scoreboard you use to determine your value? Human scoreboards ultimately do not bring peace because you will constantly need to get more points on the board in order to feel good about yourself. Is Brad Pitt still a name that people remember? Okay, back when I was in high school and college, Brad Pitt was kind of the, uh, the primo actor in Hollywood. He got all the big gigs. He seemed to have it all. Um, Money and good roles and good looks, all those sorts of things. And um, it's interesting. He was interviewed by Rolling Stone at the peak of his popularity. And here's something he said in that interview. He said that the emphasis now is on success and personal gain. I'm sitting in it. And I'm telling you, That's not it. I'm the guy who's got everything, I know. But I'm telling you, once you've got everything, then you're just left with yourself. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. It doesn't help you sleep any better, and you don't wake up any better because of it. Now, I don't know anything about Brad Pitt's faith life, if he's a Christian or not. In some ways, this statement is even more powerful if he's not, although I wish and hope he is. But it doesn't really matter whether he's a Christian or not, because this is reflective of how every single person, whether they believe in God or not, ultimately feel as they continue to pursue value based on the things of this world. Ultimately, it never fulfills totally. Now, There's another guy that I know. 
he too, by the age of 30, was at the pinnacle of his profession. He was kind of the guy that all the other people under him were looking up to. Then this guy met Jesus, and he lost everything from a worldly perspective. And he spent the rest of his life, well, again, from a worldly perspective, seemingly suffering. His name was Paul. And at one time, as a Jewish leader, the pinnacle of his profession. The last half of his life, after he met Jesus, from a circumstantial perspective, shipwrecked and tortured and beaten and poor. And as he writes to a church in Galatia, listen to what he writes in Galatians 6. This is his Rolling Stone quote. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me. What he's saying there, I knew what it was to have everything the world has. The world's not as important to me anymore. The things of this world aren't. And I to the world, I realize now that I'm going to live out this life as best as I can, but I was created for something even greater than that, to live for eternity with Jesus. And so as he thought about that, Paul writes, as he thinks about his life, there's only one place I'm going to boast. It's not in my successes. It's not in my house. It's not in the title before my name or the letters after my name. If I'm going to boast, I boast in the cross and I boast in Jesus Christ. If you want to be confident, if I want to be confident in feeling valuable, and as sinners, it's not going to be perfect all the time. We're going to have days where we just don't feel great about ourselves. We're going to have to bring ourselves back to this truth. If we want to feel confident and valuable, you look to the cross because it is there where your value was established. The cross says, Jesus loves you so much that he said nothing in front of Pontius Pilate, allowed himself to be nailed to a cross and suffered hell in your place. The cross says you are so valuable that Jesus gave up his life and now you are forgiven child of God. The cross is the place to find your value. And when you find it there, let me tell you, it still hurts when things don't go well at work. It still hurts when you lose the game, but it will not crush you because that's not where you find your value. That's not where you find your identity. When you boast, Paul says, boast in the cross of Christ. So the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest. <laughs> Here's what Jesus says to them in verse 35. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 aside, or 12, and said, and, and this is where I want you to understand the, the, the one main takeaway for today when it comes to the attitude that citizens in the kingdom of God has. Jesus said, anyone who wants to be first must be last and must be the very last and the servant of all. Here's what Jesus is saying, number three. In the kingdom of God, there is more value in serving others than in serving ourselves. That is, is countercultural. <laughs> that there is more value in being the servant than being the one who is being served. In fact, I'll say it this way, God's, God's kingdom feels like it's upside down, doesn't it? That there's value in service, more value than in being served. That, that there's value um, not necessarily in receiving praise, but in giving praise. That in God's kingdom, what he values more than accomplishing things for ourselves 
is helping others and being a blessing to other people. And the way that Jesus said this in the upper room, this is a verse we come back to a lot because I need to hear it a lot and maybe you do too. When Jesus said the one characteristic or attribute that was going to identify his people from the rest of the world, it was what? Love. That love and service being a servant to other people, are what it looks like to be citizens in God's kingdom, the kingdom of God. And do you know what? The first and second century Christians, they epitomized this. I don't want you to get the idea that they were perfect either. They were sinful and flawed just like us. But in this area, they hit it out of the park. In fact, this is one of the main reasons, their service and love, why Christianity went from being outlawed in the Roman government to eventually being the only religion in the Roman Empire. In the 100s and 200s AD, um, there were plagues that were going through Rome and the Roman Empire. Thousands of people were dying um, literally every day. Dionysus One of the secular historians of that time, he writes this about the Christian church and the Christians. Christians during that time showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and only thinking of one another. Heedless or not concerned about danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them at times, because they also got sick as a minister to those who were sick, departed this life, not upset that they died, but serenely happy, for they were infected by others with the disease or the plague, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. And I read this, I couldn't help but think, how are we doing? Individually, but as a church. Not just here, but the church across the country, the church across the world. And it is true that so often, and there's varying reasons for this, the Christian church is seemingly known more for for judgment than for love. And is judgment needed? Is truth needed? Absolutely. And if that comes off as, as judgment, well, we need to speak truth. But even then, it needs to be salted, spiced with grace and with love, with an understanding that I'm sharing truth not because I'm better than you, but because I love you. Here's the thing I want you to wrestle with this week. It's our number four takeaway. As citizens in the kingdom of God, I know so many of you already have this servant heart. I also know that all of us can live out that identity better. So in what way can you be a better servant this day moving forward? Maybe... Young people, it's not complaining every time mom and dad ask you to do something. Wouldn't that be nice, parents? That you are called to be a servant and that you lovingly serve mom and dad. Maybe instead of being so consumed by accomplishments at work, we think for a moment, how can I at work help support the people around me and help them succeed. Maybe it's getting involved in your community. Maybe it's baking cookies for someone across the street. Maybe it's volunteering here at church. We have hundreds of people who understand this importance of being a servant. Oh, by the way, North Cross Kids, the number of kids that are coming to North Cross Kids just keeps growing. We'd love some servants who are not yet involved, to be a part of North Cross Kids. In what way can you be a better servant? (laughs) I mentioned the example of Paul. I want to close this series with a better example. The best. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God when he came to this earth something to be used to his own advantage. He didn't use his powers as God to make his earthly life perfect. (laughs) Rather, he made himself nothing. 
He took on the very nature of a servant. He was made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, our king humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. We have an amazing king. It's a blessing to be a part of his kingdom. Let's pray. Dear Lord, um, thank you for establishing my value, our value, and how you feel about us by being willing to suffer hell itself in our place. Lord, there are going to be times where we don't feel great about who we are, how we look, what we have, what we can do. Help us to snap out of that quickly and to be reminded that our value was established when you made us a part of your family through the work of our King, Jesus. And may now, as our value has been established, may our life not be about establishing our value, but instead, we are free to merely be servants and to be blessings to others. Pray for your grace and blessing as we look to respond in that way. In Jesus' name, amen.